الحمد للہ وصلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ والا علی وصاب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وقل جا الحق و ذاق الباطل ان الباطل کا نہ ذہو کا رب شلی صدری و سلی عمری و حل العقدت من لسانی افق و قولی ڈونریبل سلطان محمد ابو بکر دا سلطان آف سوکوٹو اینڈ دا ریلیجس لیڈر of more than 100 million Muslims of Nigeria, the governors, the respected dignitaries, and my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Before I start my presentation of the day, I would like to speak for a few minutes regarding our dear brothers and sisters in Palestine. Most of us are, most of us are aware of the history of Palestine. Hitler incinerated 6 million Jews. It was a holocaust. Many of these Jews, they took shelter in Palestine. And our Muslim brothers in Palestine they welcome them with open hearts. They welcome their cousins, the Jews, with open hearts. Come and take shelter in our home. They welcome them. But what happened? Many years later, the same people who were welcomed by the Muslim brothers in Palestine, they take them out of their own home. They occupy their home. And when the Muslim brothers are crying, please give a home back. They are calling them as terrorists. And this is common. You see this happening many places in the world. We know that the Britishers, the French, the Portuguese, they occupied more than two thirds of the world, especially the Britishers. They occupied many parts of the world. They came to my country, India, and they called Bhagat Singh. When Bhagat Singh tried to take them out of India, they called him as the biggest terrorist at that time. They occupied USA, America. And when George Washington fought again for the freedom of the country, the Britishers called George Washington as terrorist number one. We know the history of South Africa. Nelson Mandela, when he fought for his freedom, he was called as terrorist number one and imprisoned in Robben Island for more than 25 years. But we Indians, we call Bhagat Singh as a freedom fighter, not a terrorist. The Americans, they call George Washington not as a terrorist, but as one of the greatest freedom fighter. The South Africans, they call Nelson Mandela not as a terrorist, but one of the greatest freedom fighter. Same way today, when our Muslim brothers in Palestine, they are doing physical fire. They are protecting the only space of Islam, and fighting for the freedom most of the world. is on terrorists. We call them as freedom fighters. They protect the land. And we know today, in the last one month, they, the Israelis have been doing atrocity for decades. For more than 50 years. In the last one month, they have killed thousands of innocent Palestinians, women, children. We condemn this genocide and we ask the world to tell Israel to stop this genocide. We pray for our Palestinian brothers and sisters that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant Jannah to the people who have been martyred. May Allah give them sabr to sustain this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them victory and raise them in Jannah Firdos. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's easy for him to solve this problem. What is Allah doing? He's testing us. And I'll cover this in my talk. Allah is testing us. 
and the Palestinians, alhamdulillah, most of them will get flying colors. But what about us Muslims? What are we doing? I gave a speech on the 13 action points for the Muslim Ummah as far as Palestine is concerned. I don't intend giving this talk now. Time is short. I have to finish my speech in one hour. That's the time limit led by me, one hour. I start at one o'clock. I have to finish by two o'clock. Allah is testing us. What are we Muslims doing? They will pass with flying colors. They are doing fardi kafaya. What are we Muslims all over the world doing? Are we doing a job? Please do listen to my talk on 13, point act, 13 action points for the Muslim Ummah for Palestine. <clears throat> the Sultan had invited me for this program more than three months back. And after I accepted the invitation to come on 2nd of November, my lawyers told me that there is an important case going on in Malaysia. You have to attend on 2nd of November. I said, no, I have given the vote to the Sultan. I cannot cancel my trip. And today morning, few hours back was the hearing, the final verdict of the case. I had sued, I had filed a, demission, I had filed a defamation case against Ramaswamy, who is the deputy chief minister of Penang. He was, because he insulted me. Four years ago, in August 2019, I gave a talk in Klantan, a state in Malaysia. And mashallah, there were more than 100,000 people for my talk. It was the largest religious gathering in Malaysia, mashallah. A foreigner coming and giving a talk in Klantan, more than 100,000 people gathered, and the chief minister gave me the award, Dai of the Ummah. The non-Muslim enemies of Islam, they could not digest it. Few days after the talk, they started maligning me. Zakir is the terrorist, Zakir is the hate preacher, so what I did, I picked up the five most important people who maligned me. And most of them, all of them were politicians. One, what I did, I sued them in the court of law. When I sued them, one person was a cabinet minister of human resources. Second person was a deputy chief minister of Penang. One person was member of parliament. Fourth person and the fifth person, they were member of assemblies, all politicians, all of them of Indian origin, maligning me. What I did, I filed the suit against them. They told, who is this foreigner? When we criticize the prime minister, no one does a case against us. Who is this foreigner who is suing us? Allah blessed. Most of them, they did the outside court settlement with me and they apologized to me. I said, no problem. But the biggest enemy of Islam, who I call, I did not forgive him. I said, we let the court case go on. The court case went for two years. And today morning was the verdict. Today morning, few hours before the verdict was there. And the judge told, told Ramasamy, who was at that time the deputy chief minister of Penang, to pay a fine of 1.52 million Malaysian ringgit to Dr. Zakir Naik as compensation. 1.52 Malaysian ringgit is equivalent to 320,000 US dollars. It is equal to 383 million Naira. If $1 is 1,200 Naira, then the judge of High Court ordered Ramaswamy to pay Dr. Zakir Naik within 30 days. 1.52 million ringgit, which is equal to 320,000 US dollars, which is equal to 383 million Naira. And I today, I pledge this amount, this complete amount for the cause of Palestine. I want to donate this full amount. This is the least I can do. This complete amount of 1.52 million ringgit, 320,000 US dollars, 
383 million naira I pledge it as a donation to the Palestinian cause for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this wording just came few hours before, today early morning. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he grant the martyrs and the firdaus. May he give sabr to the brothers and sisters in Palestine. May he give them istiqama. And inshallah, inshallah, victory will be ours. Surely, Allah is testing us. Are we following the Quran or not? Today, the topic of my presentation. First, I'd like to thank the Sultan to invite me as the guest speaker for the closing ceremony of the 10th Sheikh Usman bin Foydu week, 1445 after Hijri, which is 2023 Christian era. I would like to thank him. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to come here to the state of Sokoto. It is the second time I'm coming to Nigeria after 10 years, and this is the first time I'm coming to the state of Sokoto. And I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed by the state of Sokoto, mashallah. I'm told more than 99% are Muslims. And I'm happy to meet the leader of more than 100 million Muslims in Nigeria, the Sultan of Sokoto. The topic of today's presentation is Al-Quran, the global necessity. Al-Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. <laughs> Allah says in the glorious Quran in Surah Rod chapter number 13 verse number 38 and in every age have we sent a revelation have we sent a book by name four revelations are mentioned in the Quran Torah, Zabur, Injil and the Quran Torah is the wahi which was given to Prophet Moses peace be upon him Zabur is the wahi which was given to David peace be upon him Injil was the, wahi, the revelation given to Jesus peace be upon him glorious Quran is the last and final revelation given to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. But there were many other revelations besides this. For example, Suhuf Ibrahim and many others. As the Quran says, in every age have we sent a revelation. But all the revelations that came before the Quran, they were meant only for a particular time period and was meant only for a particular time period. But since the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation, it was not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was meant for the whole humanity and it is meant till the last day of judgment. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1, Alif Lam Ra, we have given this book to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to guide humanity from darkness to light. Not to guide the Muslims or the Arabs, but to guide the whole of humanity from darkness to light. Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52, here is the message for mankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. Allah repeats the message in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 185. Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to humanity. Allah repeats the message in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse 41 that this is a message given to thee to instruct humankind, given to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not to instruct only the Muslims or the Arabs, but to instruct the whole of humanity. This glorious Quran was revealed for the whole of humanity. The glorious Quran, it is the future world constitution. It is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a warning to the heedless. It's a guide to the erring. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering. It's a hope to those in despair. 
because the Quran is the future world constitution, it is a global necessity. Because the Quran is the most positive book in the world, the Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is the proclamation to humanity, the glorious Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is the fountain of mercy and wisdom, Al Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is the guidance to humanity, it is a global necessity. Because the Quran is a warning to the heedless, the glorious Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is an assurance to those in doubt, Al Quran is the global necessity. Because the Quran is a solace to the suffering, Al Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is a hope to those in despair, Al Quran is a global necessity. Whenever you have any equipment, a lot of equipment comes and strengthens you. The more equipment, the more of an instruction manual. So that how to use equipment. If you allow me to call a human being a machine, I would say it is the most complicated machine in the world. It is more complicated than the highest computer in the world. Don't you think we require a manual? The human being with a machine, if you allow me to call it a machine, more than the most advanced computer in the world, don't you think it requires an instruction manual? The instruction manual for the human being, it is the glorious Quran. The glorious Quran is the last and final instruction manual revealed by the creator of the human being. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Alladhi khalakal mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. As I told you earlier, that Allah is testing us. For Allah, it's very easy. For Allah to make the Palestinian win over Israel, it's kun fa yakun. Allah is testing us. Are they struggling and striving for the cause of Allah? Allah is testing all the human beings in the world. Are you standing for the truth? So this life, according to the glorious Quran, is a test for the hereafter. If we pass this test, we go to Jannah, paradise. If we fail, we go to hell. We go to Jahannam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Chapter 51, verse 56. That we have created the jinn and the human beings not to worship me. What is the purpose of our life? Why are we here? Have we ever thought, what are we doing here? Allah gives the answer in Surah Dariya, chapter 56, verse 56. Allah has created and the men not but to worship him. So we are in this world as a test for the hereafter. Our role, our purpose is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've given a talk and you should see this lecture of mine, what is the purpose of creation? When we obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are doing ibadah. We are worshipping him. If we follow the commandments, we are worshipping him. If we stay away from things he has prohibited, we are worshipping him. Ibadah means following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First we have to understand the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll be dealing in detail in my talk on Friday, Halloween, the concept of God's major world religion. But the best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Surah Ikhlas. Chapter 112, verse number 1 to 4, where Allah says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah is Samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ahad. There is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. 
in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number one and four. Verse number one to four. If any person says so and so entity is God, if he fits in the four line definition of Surah Ikhlas, we Muslims have no objection in accepting that entity as Allah, as God. The first is, Qul Allahu Ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Number two, Allahu Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yulad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufana. There's nothing like him. This surah class is the touchstone of theology. It is the touchstone of theology. Theo means God. Logic means study. Theology, study of God. And touchstone, you know, when you go to buy and sell gold jewelry, you go to a goldsmith and you want to verify how pure is the gold. So the goldsmith takes the gold and rubs it against the touchstone. And depending upon the color, he tells you whether this gold is 24 karat gold, whether 22 karat gold, whether 18 karat gold, or it may not be gold at all, because all that glitters is not gold. So Surah class is the touchstone of theology. The God you are worshipping, you put into the test of Surah class. If the God you are worshipping passes the test of Surah Ikhlas, he is a true God. If he fails the test, he is a false God. You know, there are some people, some human beings, who say, who claim, Bhagawan Rash needs to be God. Some people, I didn't say Hindus. Hinduism doesn't say that Bhagawan Rajneesh is God. But there are some human beings, many of them, who claim Bhagawan Rash needs to be God. Let's put this Bhagavan Rashnish to the test of Surah class. <clears throat> Let us put Bhagavan Rashnish to the test of Surah class. Kul Huallahu Ahad. Test number one. Say is Allah one and only. Is Bhagavan Rajnish one? There are thousands of men who have claimed to be God, especially the country where I come from, India. There are thousands of men who say they are God. Is he the only one? No. The second test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. We know from the biography of Rajnish that Bhagavan Rajnish, he was suffering from asthma, from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. The third test. Lam yalad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. And we know that Bhagavan Rajnish, he was born and he had a mother and father who later on became his own disciple. He was born in Jabalpur in India and his parents became his own disciple. In May 1981, Bhagwan Rajnish goes to USA and in the state of Oregon he starts his own center called as Rajnish Puram and thousands of Americans and Europeans gather there later on the American government arrests him and puts him in prison Bhagwan Rajnish claims that the American government gave me slow poisoning in spirit in the prison the American government gave me slow poison. Imagine Almighty God me slow poison. And later on, in 1985, he's kicked out of America and he comes back to India and in the city of Pune, in the state of Maharashtra, where I live, in the city of Pune, he starts the center of Neo Sanyas. And later on, he calls it the Osho Commune. If you go to a center Osho Commune, has thousands of Europeans and Westerners from all over the world. When you go to his Osho commune in his Samadhi, you know when the Hindus die, they put the ashes and they make a Samadhi. On his Samadhi is mentioned Osho Rajnish never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died. But visited the earth from the 11th of December 
to the 19th of January 1990. They forgot to mention in his samadhi that he was not given visas to 22 different countries of the world. Almighty God coming to visit the world and he requires visas to go to different countries. And the Archbishop of Greece said, if you don't take out Rajneesh and his followers from this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciple. And the last test, the fourth test is so stringent that no one beside true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can pass. There's nothing like him. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he's not God. We know Rajneesh, like the normal human beings, he had two hands, two legs, one nose, two eyes, a long beard. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. Suppose someone says that Bhagwan, suppose someone says that God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You heard the name Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. Universe, strongest man in the world. If someone says Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be King Kong, whether it be Dara Singh, the moment, whether it is thousand times or million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. There's nothing like him. This is the four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to find out whether he's true God or not. So I request all the people, check up the God you're worshipping. If it passes the test of Surah Ikhlas, the true God. Otherwise, it's a fake God. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 48, that Allah forgiveth not associating partners with him. Anything else, if he pleases, he may forgive. For anyone who associates partners with Allah, he has created a grave, heinous sin. Allah repeats the message in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 116. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive anyone joining gods with him. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive. For anyone who joins God with Allah, he has strayed away far. So shirk is the biggest sin in Islam. It is the biggest sin. It is the number one major sin. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 73, all those who you call upon besides Allah, if they gather together, listen to this parable, the verse starts, listen to this parable, that all those who you worship besides Allah, if you call them, and if all of them gather together besides Allah, to create a fly, they will not be able to do it. And if the fly snatches away something, they will not be able to get it back. Feeble are those who petition, and feeble are those to whom they petition. Allah is telling in the Quran that all the false gods that you worship. You know, according to Hindu scriptures and Hinduism alone, there are, 300, there are 33 crow gods. That means 330 million gods. If all the religions put together, there are hundreds of millions of God. Allah is telling here in this verse of the Quran, if all these people who you worship besides Allah, these hundreds of millions of gods, false gods, that you worship besides Allah, if they gather together to create a fly, they will not be able to do it. And the verse continues. If the fly snatches something away, they won't even be able to get it back. They decide create a fly, they cannot even get back if the fly snatches something from them. Feeble, weak are those people who pray to them and weak are those people to whom they pray. Because the glorious Quran explains to us the concept of true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Quran is a global necessity. The Quran talks about Salah. In English, people normally translate Salah as prayer. 
Prayer, if you open the dictionary, means to beseech, to ask for help. According to me, prayer is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word salah. What we do dua after the salah, that is prayer. The salah is far superior to praying. In the salah, besides asking for help, we are getting guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabic word salah comes from the root word salah, means connection. The servant connects with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So salah means connecting to God. I call it the programming towards righteousness. When we pray, we read Surah Fatiha, after that Imam is telling us, he's giving us guidance, don't lie, don't cheat. Five times a day, we are being programmed towards righteousness. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah an Kabu, chapter 29, verse 45, Utlu am, Utlu ma uhiya ilayka kitab wa aqimu salat. Recite of what we have revealed to thee of the Quran and establish salah. For salah restrains you from shameful and unjust deed. That means salah keeps you on the straight path. It prevents you from shameful and unjust deed. It prevents you from sin. So if you offer salah correctly, you will be on the straight path. Because salah, because the Quran teaches us about salah, the Quran is a global necessity. The Quran speaks about zakat. It is the third pillar of Islam. That every rich human being, every rich Muslim, who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth. Every lunar year in charity. If every rich human being in the world gives zakat, gives this 2.5% charity, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And there are several surahs of the Quran, multiple times, aqimu salah, wa'atu zakah. Establish salah and give your zakah. Multiple times in the Quran, surah Baqarah, surah Imran, surah Nisa. The Quran talks about the fourth pillar of Islam, Psalm. That every adult Muslim who has the health and is not traveling, it's compulsory that he fasts in the month of Ramadan. He abstains from drinking or eating food and sex from dawn to sunset. In the complete month of Ramadan. I call Ramadan as the overhauling of the human body. Like when you have a car or a motorcycle, you require to service it. Maybe every six months, every year. Similarly, if you call this human being a machine, it requires servicing at least once a year for one month. If you can abstain from smoking from dawn to sunset, you can very well abstain from smoking from the cradle to the grave. If you can abstain from drinking alcohol from dawn to sunset, very well you can abstain from having alcohol from the cradle to the grave. Ramzan is a month which encourages you to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It encourages you to do good deeds and it encourages you to stop the evil deed. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 183, Ramzan Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 183 that fasting was prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people before you so that you may learn self-restraint, so that you may learn taqwa, so that you may learn God consciousness, so that you may learn piety. So the main reason our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed us to fast for one month in the month of Ramadan is so that we attain taqwa, righteousness. God consciousness, piety. The glorious Quran speaks about the fifth pillar, that is Hajj. It is compulsory for every adult Muslim who has health and has the economic means that at least once in his lifetime, he should perform Hajj, the pilgrimage. 
in the month of Hajj from 8th to the 13th of Zilijjah and travel to the city of Makkah, the state of Makkah, Mina, Arafah, Muzdalifah, back to Mina and Makkah in the six days from 8th to the 13th of Zilaj. And there's a full surah by the name Surah Hajj, chapter 22 in the Quran. And this Hajj is the biggest annual gathering in the world where more than 4 million people gather from different parts of the world, from USA, from Canada, from UK, from Pakistan, from India, from Saudi Arabia, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from different parts of the world. And the men, they're dressed in two pieces of unsewn cloth. You cannot identify the person next to you whether he's a king or a pauper. All equal in the sight of Allah. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Here I am, O oh my Lord, at your service. It is the best example of universal brotherhood in the world. Whether black or white, yellow or brown, two pieces of unsewn cloth, all equal in the sight of Allah. Because the glorious Quran teaches us about Salah, about Psalm, about Zakat, about Hajj, I say Al-Quran is a global necessity. The Quran gives us the criteria for a person to go to Jannah, to attain salvation. <clears throat> Allah says in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr, Inna al-insana la fi khusr, illa ladhina amanu wa aminu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqa wa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, Man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who do righteous deed, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. Those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These minimum four criteria are required for any human being to go to, go to Jannah. Number one is Iman having faith. Number two, amal salihat righteous deed. Number three, watawasaw bil haq, inviting people to truth, doing dawa and islah. And number four, watawasaw bil sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these criteria is missing, under normal circumstances, you shall not go to Jannah. All four criteria are equally important. Iman, righteous deed, dawa, and inviting people to patience and perseverance. So Quran gives you the formula to attain Jannah, to go to paradise. Because Quran gives you the formula to go to Jannah, to attain paradise, I said Al-Quran is a global necessity. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number seven, hadith number 7417, the Prophet said, this world is a prison for the believers. And it is paradise for the unbelievers. There's an incident that once Hafiz Ibn Hajar Asqalani, may Allah have mercy on him, he was a great scholar. He wrote the Sharah of Bukhari, the second most important book after the Quran. When he was going in the marketplace with his entourage, he was the chief Qazi and people, a poor Jew. He comes and he catches the mule of Hafiz ibn Hajar Asqalani. Rahimullah. And he tells him, I heard that your prophet said, this world is a prison for the believers and it is paradise for the unbelievers. You, you are so rich, you are leading a luxurious life, I'm a poor man. He was wearing torn clothes. How can you explain the hadith of your prophet that this world is a prison for a believer like you who are so rich and living comfortably and it's a paradise for a poor person, unbeliever like me, who's poor with torn clothes. The Hafiz Ibn Hajar Asqalani says that I know what's going to happen in the future and I know that in Akhirah, in the next life, for the believers, 
we will get paradise. And if you compare the Jannah to this world, what I'm living, compared to the Jannah, it is billion times better. This world with all the wealth is a present. And I know the unbelievers like you who do not believe in Allah, in the next life they will go to Jahannam. And the Jahannam will be so bad that even if you are the poorest man in the world, if you compare to Jahannam, your this life will be like paradise compared to Jahannam. So this is the explanation of the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Asai Muslim, Volume 7, hadith number 7417, that you may be the richest man in the world, you may have the maximum luxury, but compared to the luxury of Akhirah in Jannah, it will be a billion times better. <clears throat> so if you compare the difference between the poorest man who goes to Jannah and the richest man in the world going to Jannah, the difference is very less. So this world, you should not be bothered whether you're poor or rich, whether you're a king or a pauper. You should be bothered that you pass the test. Because the Jannah, and the Prophet said it is more easier for the poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. Because the rich man has to give his up kitab. He has to give accountability of everything. More difficult. <clears throat> so comparatively, it is billion times better than the richest man in the world. And compared to the poor man also, it is a billion times. Hardly any difference. And the Jannah is so worse. The description given in the Quran and the Hadith. Even if you are the poorest man in this world, it will be like paradise. The fire when it comes on your feet, your brains will boil. Can you believe? So, this is the explanation and this Quran, it prevents you to going from Jahannam, going to Jahannam and encourages you to go to Jannah. That is the reason I call the glorious Quran a global necessity. I'm sorry, I'm straining my voice because <clears throat> the public edit system is not up to the standard. <clears throat> and I was speaking to the Commission of Religious Affairs day for yesterday that when a mujahid goes to the battlefield, his weapon is required. For a dai when he's giving a lecture, my weapon is the microphone system. You may find my voice to be good no. as a professional. I'm, if I modulate better, the impact of my lecture becomes 10 times more, 50 times more. But Alhamdulillah, this microphone is better than yesterday's. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> and believe me, hiring a good microphone system is not expensive. But unfortunately, we Muslims are not well versed with what's required. Inshallah, we will educate ourselves. And I gave a talk to the Dais of Sokoto, more than 100 were there, mashallah. It was wonderful meeting them, mashallah. Now, continuing with the talk, the glorious Quran has the solutions to the problems of humankind. Because the glorious Quran has the solution to all the problems of humankind, I say, Al Quran is a global necessity. Al-Quran is the Furqan. Allah refers to the Quran as Furqan, the criteria to judge right from wrong. Al-Quran has the solution to the problem of racism. One of the biggest problems in the world today is racism. Allah gives the solution in Surah Hujurat. Chapter number 49, verse number 13, Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakran wa unsa wa jalnaakum sha'uba wa qaba ila li ta'rafu inna karmakum in the law yatkaakum inna la alimun khabir Oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other. Not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, 
who has God consciousness, who has piety, who has righteousness. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran, it's not wealth, it's not age, it's not sex, it's not color, it is taqwa, it is righteousness, it is piety, it's God consciousness. According to the Quran, no black man is superior to a white man or a white man is superior to a black man. No rich man is superior to a poor man or a poor man for a rich man. No male is superior to a female or a female to a male. Unless, with one criteria, taqwa. Righteousness. God consciousness. Tawheed. This one verse of the Quran will solve all the problem of racism in the world if the humanity follows this. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the last and farewell pilgrimage in the Hajjat al-Vida he said that no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. No black or no non-Arab is superior to an Arab. A black man is, a white man is not superior to a black man, neither a black man is superior to a white man. Except by taqwa. And we demonstrate this every day, five times of our life. Every day in Salah. When we stand for Salah, we stand shoulder to shoulder. Feet to feet. Whether king or pauper, black or white, yellow or brown, rich or poor. When we stand for Salah in front of Allah, we stand together. It will abolish all kinds of racism in the world. Quran because it has the solution for racism, I say Al-Quran is a global necessity. Everyone in the world should know about the Quran and follow it. Then only will there be peace. Al-Quran has the solution to terrorism. One verse of the Quran is sufficient for the major solution of terrorism. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32. If anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Allah says in the Quran, if anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, kills any other innocent human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And the verse does not stop, the verse continues. And if anyone saves any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, if you save any innocent human being, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. This one verse of the Quran is the major solution for terrorism. The Israelis, they are killing thousands of innocent human beings. If they follow the Quran, in Islam, in Islam, even when we go for war, our beloved Prophet said, do not harm the women, do not harm the children, do not harm the elderly people who do not come to war, do not cut down trees. And whatever wrong information today, the Israelis are giving wrong information. What they are saying, that Hamas, you know, the Palestinians are fighting for their freedom. They killed 40 babies and they're showing video of it. All fabrication. Biden is saying, I saw with my own eyes that Hamas killed 40 babies. Fabrication. Afterwards, when you are exposed, some other American says, oh, it was a mistake. They are laying allegation that the Palestinians are killing innocent civilians. What information we have from the social media, authentic information, mashallah, even when the Palestinians are retaliating, they are not attacking purposely any innocent human being. They aren't attacking the women, aren't attacking the children. And we know of various incidents that when they go to the houses, they tell the women, we are Muslims, you are safe from us. And when they're hungry, when they attack the house, they keep the woman safe, they even take permission. Can we please take a banana from your fridge? Can you believe? 
someone is coming in your house to take back his house with arms and they're taking permission to have one banana. And when they go, when they retaliate the military of Israel and when they leave their homes, they leave the homes. And when they come and when they take food from their fridge, they leave a note, we are sorry, we ate food from your fridge and then they go back. This is Islam. And now they are blaming them that they are terrorists. Today is the world, is a global village. By social media they are being exposed. They could fabricate about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. They spent $573 million to fabricate videos to show that Israel has weapons of mass destruction. And after many years they say sorry, finish. They kill millions of Muslims in Iraq and now they say, sorry, matter is over. Today, mashallah, it's a blessing that not only Muslims, the non-Muslims, because of the social media, the majority are supporting the Palestinian cause. Though the major satellite channels, CNN, BBC, they are telling that the Palestinians are terrorists, but the social media is flooded with evidence what they're doing is wrong. You see rallies all over the world. All over the world. In America, in Western countries, in European countries, in India, in Muslim countries, even in Nigeria, hundreds of thousands of people are protesting against the injustice. This is the power of social media. Islam has the solution for terrorism. Islam has the solution for injustice. Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 135, that, Ya al amanu, oh you believe, stand not for justice, as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, with the rich or poor. When you are doing justice, don't look at him, whether he's your friend, he's your mother or a father, or a relative, or rich or poor. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, by Allah, if my daughter Fatima robs, I will chop off her hand. This is justice. Justice. Islam has the solution for alcoholism and drug addiction. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, innam al khamru al maisuru. Oh, you believe most certainly in toxic gifts and gambling. Wal ansabu wal aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich to minimally shaitan. These are said in the handiwork. Fashtani mulalluk of the frihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. In Islam, alcoholism, drug addiction, it is prohibited. You know, every day, every year, according to who? More than 4 million people die only because of alcoholism. You know, America, a few decades earlier, they tried to ban alcohol, knowing it's very bad for health. When they tried, the government collapsed. There was bootlegging, there was illegal alcohol, and the government collapsed. They again got back alcohol. 1400 years ago, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he recited the verse of this Quran, Ya Ayyuh Ladina Amanu, Inna Mal Khamru Al Maisuru, most certainly intoxicated and gambling. Ya Ladina Amanu, Inna Mal Khamru Al Maisuru, oh you believe, most certainly intoxicated and gambling. Wal Anzabu Al Aslamu, dedication of stone, divination of arrows, rich to many shaitan, these are said in the handiwork. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Just because the Prophet recited the verse of the Quran, barrels of alcohol were emptied in Medina, never to be filled again. What America with all its power could not do for many years, a Prophet did with just one verse. One verse of the Quran he, re he recited and the barrels of alcohol were emptied in Medina, never to be filled again. If Quran has the solution to the problem of of fornication, of adultery, of prostitution. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 32, come not close to adultery, for it's an evil opening other roads to evil. Come not close to adultery. Don't do adultery. Come not close to adultery, because it's an evil opening other roads to evil. Quran has the solution 
to the problem of pornography, of immodesty, of obscenity. Islam and Quran and Hadith, they prescribe hijab. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur chapter 20 verse number 30, it first speaks about hijab for the man. Ya Lidin Amun, oh you believe, lower your gaze and protect your modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman and any breath and thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. That is the hijab for the man. And for the woman, the next verse, Surah Nisa chapter 24 verse 31, say to the bleeding woman, she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of. There are basically six criteria for hijab given in the Quran and the Hadith. Number one is the extent. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and hands up to the wrist. Some say that even the face should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The clothes they wear should not be tight-fitting so that it reveals the figure. Number three, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through the clothes. Number four, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Number five, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And number six, it should not resemble that of the unbelievers. These are the six criteria for hijab. And people ask me that why hijab should be done. I tell them that if there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful, equally beautiful, if they are walking down the streets of Sokoto, and if one sister, one lady, she is wearing a, a complete hijab, Islamic hijab, complete body covered, only part seen is face and hand to the wrist. And the second twin sister, she's a westerner, wearing mini skirts or shorts with a low neck. And as they're walking down the streets of New York or Sokoto, and around the corner there is a hooligan who's waiting for a catch who, to tease a girl. Which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will it tease the girl wearing the western clothes, mini skirts and shorts? Which girl will it tease? Which girl? <laughs> mini skirts, correct. Simple question, simple answer. Quran says in Surah Zumur chapter 39, Allah says in Surah Azab chapter, chapter 33, verse 59, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women, when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized. So hijab has been prescribed to prevent the women from being molested, to protect them. So Quran has the solution for obscenity, for ease teasing, for pornography. Quran has the solution for the bribery and corruption. Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 188, eat up not wealth amongst yourself or use it as a bait for judges in order that willfully, wrongfully, you will eat other people's wealth. So giving money as bribe is prohibited in the Quran. Quran has the solution for economy. Allah says in no less than eight places, riba has been prohibited. And Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 278 and 279 about riba, about interest, that those who give up not the demands of riba, demands of interest and usury, take notice of a war from Allah and his Rasul. That means Allah and his Rasul will wage a war against you if you deal in riba. It is the 12th major sin in Islam according to Imam Adabi in his book, The Kabair, the major sin. Quran has the solution for all the problems. Whether it be an individual problem, whether it be a family problem, whether it be a society problem, whether it be a national problem, whether it be a global problem. Quran has the solution for all the problems. Therefore, I say, Quran is a global necessity. Quran has a solution, solution to the problem, whether it be social problem, whether it be psychological problem, whether it be economical problem, whether it be political problem. Because Quran has the solution to all the problems, Quran is a global necessity. I would like to end my speech by giving one more message of the Quran, which I mentioned earlier, that one of the criteria to go to Jannah is Dawah. And I'll, give, I'll be giving a talk in Abuja on the 5th of November, on Sunday, Dawah or destruction. 
Muslim choice, dawa or destruction. You do dawa, otherwise you'll be destroyed. I'll just quote one verse of the Quran of Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, where Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. Oi, Muslims, you are the best of people, the all for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor and calling us the best of people. There is no honor without responsibility. Don't you think we have a responsibility? Allah continues to say, Ta'mruna bil ma'arufi wa tanahuna in the because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah, we aren't fit to be called as Muslims. Doing dawah is part on every Muslim. Otherwise, you should not go to, go to Jannah. Only praying, fasting, hajj is not sufficient. According to Surah Al-Asr, if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. I would like to end my speech with the verse of the Quran, which is repeated three times. It's mentioned in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 33. And Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. Huwa alladhi arthal rasulu bil huda wa dinu al-haq li wa zira wa alladhi ni kulli. Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, all the other isms. Whether it be communism, atheism, Christianism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam is this time to supersede all. Kulle, overcome them all. And Allah says in two places, "Wala qari al mushrikun." How much the mushrik don't like it? And one place Allah says, "That wa kafa billahi shayda." And enough is Allah is a witness. Allah does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Allah does not require you and me to solve the problem of the Palestine. He can do within. Second, kun fayakun. Allah is giving us an opportunity to earn Jannah. Allah is seeing what you are going to do for the cause of a Palestinian brothers and sisters. Allah has given us this. All the luxury, the clothes, the food we eat. What are we doing for our brothers in Palestine? For our sisters in Palestine? I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he grant them Jannah and give them sabr and give them victory over the Zalimun. Wa akhir dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Allahu Akbar.